Let's all pray. Our holy and merciful Heavenly Father God, who loves us, as we came together for the last week to study the Word of God, many people understood the grace of God and we thank you for saving so many souls this time. Now they are born again as your children and you have given us eternal life and also we have received from you this hope of entering into your eternal kingdom and we thank you for all this grace. We were enemies of God because we left you and we were committing sins and living in our sins and wickedness but you cleansed all our sins eternally with your precious blood and you reconciled us to God and you made us holy people and we thank you. Now these who have been saved as your children until they enter the kingdom of God let them walk as your worthy children without any shame and we pray that we will live according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and only for the will of God and for the glory of God please help us and rule over our lives if there is anyone who has not understood salvation the grace of God please help them so that they can understand this amazing grace of God and let them partake in this amazing glory and eternal salvation of yours and we thank you that you have brought us together to learn the words of God please give us your word that you want to teach us today and how we ought to conduct ourselves teach us all these today please take hold of the lips of the preacher and the hearts of the listeners please Holy Spirit take hold all of them and lead us and guide us and we pray all this in Jesus name Amen let's open our Bible to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4 Mark chapter 4 from verse 26 Mark chapter 4 from verse 26 to 29 I'll read from verse 26 to 29 and he said the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow he himself does not know how for the earth yields crops by itself first the blade then the head after that the full grain in the head but when the grain ripens immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come Yes, up to there. We have been coming together for the last week, for the past week, and we have studied the Bible diligently, many scriptures. And all of you who came to the word to study the word of God you came because of God's help we believe that it is God who made you come here those who are saved before you have been praying so that you could come to study the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 it says how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation The salvation we have received from God is so amazing and great, glorious. We do not know full scope of salvation yet. But as much as my salvation is great and important to me, we also regard salvation of anyone else equally great. Just as God sees us as a precious being before Him, we also see each other as a precious spirit before God. 
our family, friends, and neighbors. God loves them all. And Christ died for them. They are precious souls for whom Christ died. So as we preach the gospel so that they can be saved, that's something that we obviously have to do, those who are saved before others. This is the most precious work. So the only Son of God, Jesus, died on the cross and shed His holy and precious blood. He has cleansed our sins eternally. And those who have understood the grace of God, we invest our time, money, if necessary, even our lives, to preach the gospel, to save even more people. That is how God saves men. If those who are saved first close their mouth and they, have, they say nothing, they do not pray for any other soul, if they do not preach the gospel, then no one would be saved. Therefore, Paul said, If I don't preach the gospel, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. If you pass by someone who's drowning and if you do not save him, even though you can, then you are responsible. Every time you pass that place, then you'll hear the cry of the person who drowned to death. You coward! You could have saved me! You left, left me to drown and die! You are a murderer! Your heart will hear that cry. Whether people hear or not, we have the responsibility to preach. In fact, whether to receive salvation or not, it's the responsibility of the person who hears the gospel. So we preach the gospel, we work hard and we invest our time and money so that people can hear the gospel and receive salvation. This is God's work. And when people receive salvation by hearing the word of God, it, it is an amazing miracle that you are saved. You have received salvation for free. In this world, if you receive anything for free, then that is not very valuable, usually. If anyone says, I'll give you something for free, you might think that, oh, he's trying to con me into something. There's no free lunch in this world, is there? But God can and does indeed give us for free. Why? Because no one can pay the price. It is so valuable, no one can pay the price for our salvation. No money in this world can send a soul into heaven. That's why God saves man for free freely so it is amazing and it is so great we know that's our salvation so if you're saved you know how precious and great your salvation is every time you study the Bible you understand this more and more you come to realize the full scope of salvation even more and more and we are filled with thanksgiving in our hearts so joy and thanksgiving because you're filled with th thanksgiving and joy, you won't repay the grace of God and you live for God and that's your Christian life. If you're really saved by understanding the grace of God, then we have the same Father and we are the brothers and sisters in Christ and we are the family of God. If you have same parents, then you are in one family. You share the joys and sorrows together, you share the destiny and you live together, help each other. That's obvious. Now this family is blood relationship, but we have been related, now we have made to come into the family of God with spirit, the spirit of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ. They say blood is thicker than water, but the blood of, the Holy, blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is much thicker and much more stronger than our blood rela rela relationship. In this world, you may live your, with your family for your lifetime, but if you're saved, you are going to heaven, and you're living in heaven forever together. And that means we have to live together, even in this world, and that is fellowship. Whenever we have time, we come together on Sundays and Wednesdays, whenever we have time. And during the week, as a cell group, brothers and sisters living in close-by areas, you help each other spiritually, materially you help each other. And until we enter the kingdom of God, we should make sure that no one stumbles or no one breaks away from this fellowship and we go to heaven together. And that is Christian life. You are no longer alone. You are a member of the household of God. So all born again Christians, all saved Christians, come together and make up collectively the church. Church is not a building. It's not a building with a cross on top of that building. People might say, oh, how magnificent building and church it is. But it is not a church. It is a church building. It is a church house or house of the church. And besides, only when people 
born again people are in that building it is true church church is ecclesia and that is sanctified people separated people people who have been distinguished and taken out called out of this world the group of people who are called out of this world that is church a sanctified group congregation of saved people if you're not born again you cannot be a member of the church so born again saints saved saints are the church a saved man can he have fellowship with someone who's not saved can a living man have fellowship with a dead man no what is then our Christian life someone who's born again we have the Father God and we have the brothers and sisters in Christ we have the same hope we share the same purpose of life and we have the same way of life same value system and we have fellowship and we serve God together we preach the gospel together we share joys and sorrows together and we share the destiny together that is fellowship and that is church now I am now a member of this church I am one of them I am a member how amazing is this this is something we have to know so from now on as a member of God's household you begin your life so from the day you're saved until you enter the kingdom of God you need to live together we all need to be living together we have no denomination your denomination my denomination your church my church no we don't have such thing all born again Christians are belonging to the one church then why then you might say do you call yourself Jesus Baptist Church we didn't put this name for ourselves for our sake you make a house you build a house and you put a name tag on the outside not for your family if it's for people who are looking for your house someone who's looking for your house look, coming and visiting your house or maybe for a postman you put a number or you put an address or a name plaque on the outside we don't have any denomination we are non-denominational and people sometimes complain uh, of having no denomination so we simply put a name that is appropriate Jesus Baptist Church of Korea some denominations are called Baptist because they baptize Presbyterian churches they have presbytery or elders they have holiness church because they want holiness the church of praising God you can call by any name but whether you have this name or that name it's really irrelevant wherever we are in, in Korea alone we have churches in every city around the world we have about 360 churches whatever they are we are all one church we don't know anything else but we know for sure that we are born again people of course there are other churches that are born again people when, when we say something like this people say do we have to come here to be saved is this the only saved church no we have never said anything like that if we are the only saved church then that will be terrible of course this is not the only place you can be saved other than us there are people around the world who are preaching the gospel and who are saved and there has to be there have to be from the day of Pentecost until now there are many churches around the world in the history there are many faithful workers of the gospel to preach the gospel but there are very few it is very difficult to find someone says I want to believe in Jesus which church should I go to and that's a very awkward question why because I'm sorry to say this there is no not, there, there aren't that many churches that we can confidently recommend because you go to any church you got nothing they do not know what salvation is what to be born again is even though you go to church for many tens of years to many of these churches no one teaches this salvation so this is a church where true born again Christians are and this is where the gospel is preached and people are saved and salvation of man's soul is the most important work in this true church and that is obvious when one soul is saved then God rejoices more than for 99 persons who do not need repentance if born again so-called born again Christians or self-professing Christians do not preach the gospel they don't want to save people then what is the use God is suffering God is long suffering and waiting even now for a thousand years like a day a day like a thousand years until everyone repents and receives salvation that God's heart must be our heart so anyone who comes to us who's not not saved we love their souls and we try our best to help that person to be saved not only in Korea around the world we do the same work we invest our time and material everything we have to preach the gospel because that is God's will and that's God's work and those who are not saved are born into this world to be saved 
and those who are saved exist in this world to preach the gospel. Whether you're just, it's not only the preacher or the pastor or evangelist who are preaching the gospel. Every born again Christian, whether you are a pastor or a layman, you have to preach the gospel. Whether you are running a business, whether you have a job employed by someone, whether you are selling and buying, whether you are working in labor force, that's your means of life, but your purpose of life is to preach the gospel. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, the preacher, the word of the preacher, Solomon, who was the, the king, the son of the great king David, he was the, the great king with all glories that anyone could ever hope for. But he said he was the son of David, king, of, king in Jerusalem, the words of the preacher. Preacher, he introduced himself as a preacher, evangelist, king of Israel, king of Jerusalem was a means of life. But his purpose, the purpose of his life was to preach. Solomon wrote that book, Ecclesiastes. What is your occupation? I'm a preacher. But in order to earn money to preach, I go to work. I fix, I mend shoes. I'm a cobbler because I want to preach the gospel. I run a small business. But that's my means. But the purpose of my life is to preach the gospel. That's my true occupation. Why? You have to earn money to send missionaries. You have to print tracts. You have to prepare a place, venue to preach the gospel. Those who are saved have to go through this sacrifice and suffering. Without that work and effort, how can new people be saved? So whatever you do, at all costs, our purpose is to preach the gospel to save men's souls. As the gospel came all the way to us, so many Christians were sacrificed even their lives do you know how many died so that the gospel could reach us and we have to do the same so that we can preach the gospel to even more people in any case many people were saved during this time because of the sacrifice and work and dedication of those who were saved before you because God worked through them and one thing you must know as a born-again Christian now is as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When I am saved, I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. Now, beloved, to be saved, to receive salvation includes so many things, forgiven of sins, saved, born again, became a child of God, received eternal life, and there are many other blessings that are included in that. We have the Holy Spirit in us. If you are saved, then you have forgiveness of sins. We know that. And you know that that's salvation, that's to be born again. Yes, that is eternal life. Oh yes, that is to be born again as, as God's child. And there's one thing that you come to know, and that is, yes, the Holy Spirit is in me. In Galatians 3, 2, this is only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, by hearing of faith? Now, it is the Holy Spirit who actually enabled you to believe in the Gospel. In 1 Corinthians 2.12 it says, We receive the Spirit of the Spirit of God, Spirit who is from God, so that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. It is the Holy Spirit who made you understand and believe in the Gospel, not because you're clever. So there's a hymn that goes like, I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within me. Now that's something that I come to know. Even though you do not know that the Holy Spirit is in you, He is still in you. The Holy Spirit is the Lord Jesus. I am in Him and He is in me. And I, I am united with Him. So in 1 Corinthians 6.17 He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. My spirit and Christ's spirit have joined into one and it cannot be separated. You put a steel into fire, into furnace and the steel becomes red hot. The fire and the steel have come together. They are united. It is steel but it is also fire. Likewise, I am in the Lord, and the Lord is in me, and I am united with the Lord. You, call, you come into the church, and you don't just meet the Lord in the church. Whether you're at home, whether you're at work, wherever you are, you are always carrying the Lord Jesus in you. You live with the Lord Jesus. If you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, then you are a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away, you are a new creation. All things have become made new creation. Your spirit, your life, your, in your life you will see and, and witness and experience amazing transformation. 
God has made us into new tra trans new creation through transformation. All things have passed away and you are a new creation. If you want to go into the new kingdom of God, you have a new earth and you have to be made into new creation. You can't be made in new creation just by going to church, by the gospel, by the word of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit. He makes me a new man. And when you are, when you are made into a new man, new creation, you can only go into, only then you can go into the new kingdom of God, new heaven and earth. So sinner has make, become righteous. Old man has become new man. And I was to be condemned and destroyed, but I can now go into the kingdom of God. I was living in sin, and I can now live for the glory of God. We have been changed. Now how amazing is this change. Now this is the power of the Holy Spirit and power of God's life. So Christian's life is not just coming to church regularly. It is not a religious life. You need to believe in the Bible according to the Bible. And you, you have the heart according to the Bible. And you live according to the Bible. Only then you can go to heaven according to the Bible. You can't simply go to church and read the Bible, expect, and you, can expect, you can't expect to go to heaven. If you simply do it as a ritual, then you have nothing to do with God. And there are so many things we need to learn after receiving salvation. The Bible contains many teachings for those who are not saved. And, and there are also teachings for salvation. And there are even more teachings for those who are saved about how to live good, good Christian life. And we have to learn one by one from now. So why do we come to church? Church is teaching congregation. It's a congregation where you are taught the Word of God. So there is teaching of the Word of God and there are so many teachings from the Word of God that we need to teach, we need to learn and God wants to teach us. So when we come together there's a teaching. Teaching of the Holy Spirit. Whenever we come together there's something that we need to learn and understand and we come to learn that. We don't come to see the face of the pastor. We don't come to simply do a ritual service. Of course it is a service but your entire life service and your life here or there is only extension of, of service. You can't say let's begin our service and let's finish our service. There's nothing like that in the Bible. Our entire life living for God is service given to God. So when you come together and study the Bible we learn how to give better service to God. That is more appropriate expression. So when we come together, the most important thing that we do is to study the Word of God. And as we learn together, the Holy Spirit works in us. These days you can listen to the sermon lying down in your bed on the internet. Our sermons are all uploaded on the internet. But rather than, more than that, we need to come together on Sundays, Wednesdays, whenever we can, we come and study the Bible and that's where the Holy Spirit works. So we have to come and the purpose of coming together is to study the Word of God. We have to be diligently coming together all the time. So what do we have to do after receiving salvation? You don't need to worry about others, but now you just have to come as often as possible to study the Word of God. Salvation is given by the power of God and even your Christian life is not by your might, but it is the by power of God, and it is, it is by God's help. So in John 1, 16, it says, And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. We received grace of salvation when we were saved, but we must continue to receive grace of God. There's a hymn that goes like, He gives us, He gives us, He gives us all the more. He gives us His grace, but He gives us even more. As we, are, as we receive more and more grace of God, we grow in our faith, we were wicked and, and vile on the outside and all that old self, old sinful character diminishes and the character of Christ is formed in me. By the word of God I am growing in faith and we are transformed. Salvation is by the blood of Jesus. Forgiveness of, forgiveness of sin, salvation, they're all same. And the transformation of our heart is by the word of God with the help of the Holy Spirit. In John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. There is a life given for eternal life that for salvation, but there is even more of that, more abundantly as we continue to study the Word of God. By studying the Word of God, even though you are saved, if you are lazy in studying the Word of God, you may be born, but you cannot grow. Then you cannot live your Christian life. So we have to diligently come together to study the Word of God. We must be diligently learn the Word of God. If you want to see how good a person is living a Christian life, all you have to see is how he listens to the Word of God. 
if you listen with the bright eyes, lest he may miss any word, then he is good. Then his power, God's power, is manifest, manifested in his life abundantly. And after some time, you even surprised how much you have changed. Today, we are going to learn about something that we all have to learn after receiving salvation. So I'd like to tell you from Mark chapter 4 today. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. I'll read it again. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. And then the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus, whenever he explains a very important truth, he liked telling the truth with the parable. He used a parable that anybody could understand to explain the truth. So in Matthew chapter 13, also Mark chapter 4, there are the parables of the sower, or sowing the seed. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter the seed on the ground. Jesus came from the kingdom of God to this world. Why? To save the sinners who are perishing, so that the sinners can be taken into the kingdom of God. That's what it means. So this is how a sinner is saved and how a sinner is brought into the kingdom of God. It's like sketching a seed on the ground. So this is the parable of explaining to us how a sinner can go into the kingdom of God, heaven. In Mark chapter 4 verse 14 he says, The sower is the son of man, and the seed is the word of God. The sower sows the word. Why? Because in the seed is life. The word of God has life as we read and Hear the word of God. God's life is transferred and given to us. It is an amazing miracle. Seed has no shape, no form. But if you sow a seed with the right amount of moisture and temperature, it grows and bears fruit, has flowers. And that's an amazing life, miracle of life. As we preach the gospel, the word of God rings in our ears and it, it comes into our heart. And then the life of God is planted in our hearts. It's a miracle. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 28, 23, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. When the word was preached to you, the seed is sown into them. The, the life of God is sown, and then the life is manifested by salvation. So sower sees the word. Sower sows the word. And by day and by night, he doesn't know how it grows. It grows, nevertheless. So this is, this is passing of time. First, the blade. The blade is the beginning of life. As we hear the word of God and understand the gospel, we begin new life, the life of God, eternal life. This is the blade. An extraordinary. So first, the head. Then the, first, the blade and then the head. Head represents the growth. This is the growth of life. If you are born, if you begin your life, you have to grow. When we say we are saved, it means we are born again as God's children. We are born. This is the birth. If you are born, then you have to grow as God's children. This is the process of growth. And this is the head. And after that, the full grain in the head. This is the result or fruit of life. And once it is fully ripened, it is cut with sickle, taken into the bonds of kingdom of God. So when a man goes into heaven, there are three stages. Three stages. In other words, we call it the three stages of salvation. Now there are in many places, salvation, the word salvation in the Bible, but just because it says salvation or saved, doesn't mean that they're all the same. They may mean different. There are largely three kinds of salvations. In Ephesians 2, 8, we read it last night, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now God gives us this grace freely, unconditionally, 
So by faith, through faith, we have been saved. So we received salvation. Gift or grace, they're the same. They're synonym. And gift, you receive it. You don't need to pay money. You don't need to work. But you just have to receive that gift. So you have been saved. This is the salvation of our soul or salvation of our spirit. You have been saved. This takes place once in your lifetime. It is something that happened in the past. If you were saved 10, 10 years ago, then you were saved 10 years ago. Some 30 years ago, some yesterday, some the day before yesterday. Maybe some of you are saved even today. So if you're saved in the past, then you have been saved. Present perfect tense. You have been saved and you continue with the salvation. So in First Peter chapter 1 verse 8, it says, You have not seen Jesus, but you love Him. But yet believing, you rejoice with joining, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, salvation of our spirits. Our, sin, our souls that were dead in our sins and trespasses, we are now alive. In Ephesians 2, 1, You He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Those who are not saved are dead in their spirits, and they are cut off from God. When they are saved, they are reconnected with God. A prodigal son, when he comes back to the father, he was lost but found, but he was dead, now alive. That's what it is. That's the salvation of soul. You only are saved once in your lifetime. Some people say, you hear their prayer, God, please make me saved again this time. Make me born again. Make me born again again. Make me reborn again. That's something that, we, that that person doesn't know what salvation is. You can only be saved once in your lifetime. It's not like you receive salvation and lose salvation and get it again. Salvation is perfect. It is eternal. In John chapter 10, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Lord has given us eternal life. Eternal life is never lost. How can you call it eternal life if you lose it? So they shall never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my, hand, my Father's hand. Security of salvation is not in my hands, but it is in the Lord's hands. The treasure that's deposited in the vault in the National Reserve Bank may be robbed by bank robbers, but the salvation is never lost. There's a hymn that goes like, He has purchased with His blood and He will never let go. Do you think the Lord will let us go? It is double, triple security in God's hand, in the Father's hand, in Jesus' hand. Someone says, you can lose your salvation even if, you do, even if you're saved. You can lose your salvation if you do wrong. But that is not right. There are scriptures that may look like they mean that, but that doesn't mean that. Now, some time ago, a pastor called me from America and said, Pastor, many pastors in America teach that you can lose salvation if they could commit some serious sins. It's terrible. I, I think you've got, to, you've got to teach them by gathering them all up. Yes, that's right. Many people teach that doctrine. But it is not right. It is wrong. If you are saved by your works, then you may lose it if you don't maintain your salvation, your good works. If your child is born because of the child's work, then the child may lose the sonship if he does wrong. But birth has nothing to do with your work. It is because of your parents and, and children relationship. Whether you, whether, you do, whether you do good or whether you're bad, you're still a child of your parents and that doesn't change. Relationship doesn't change. You may be a good child, you may be a bad child, but is still a child of the parents. So it is eternal salvation, eternal redemption, and that's why it is eternal and perfect. If you are really saved, then that salvation is never lost. It is in God's hands, and God keeps it safe. The devil cannot take it away from you. Now that is the first salvation. Isn't this extraordinary? Now this is once in a lifetime receiving salvation. Whenever you die, you go to heaven if you are saved. And then there is the second salvation. Let's have a look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Let us read together. 
Therefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Apostle Paul, he went to Philippi and he preached the gospel and many were saved. But when he was writing these Philippians, he was in the Roman prison as he was preaching the gospel. So he was writing this from the prison and sent his epistle to the saints in Philippi. Now much more now in my absence, not only when I was present with you, but in my absence much more. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He says, work out your salvation. Now this is a continuing thing that you do continuously in your presence. This is present tense. And some people say, look, he says we have to work out for our salvation. You, can't never, you can never say you are saved or you have been saved. But that is not right. This is different salvation. Now this is salvation that is applicable to those who are already saved. If you already have money, then you don't have to get more. You don't have to get that money. Now this is also, it doesn't mean that you have to perfect perfect your salvation because it is not perfect. As I said, this is salva the salvation that we have is perfect and eternal. And also fear is not because we are fearful of going to hell. Yes, you are saved. Even though you are saved, you still have your old man, old self, or old flesh, your old personality. Our heart that is def defiled beyond anything, above anything, and it is beyond the cure. And it will be good if it could change overnight, but it doesn't change overnight. Even though we have the Holy Spirit, even though we have the life of God, our old character still remains. So in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, My inner man who wants to obey the word of God, and the outer man that wants to follow the lust of the flesh, they struggle, they fight against each other. When you hear the word of God, you feel, oh, thank you, you saved me, a wretched sinner like me, and I, I, I am yours, my body and my soul, yours. I want to live or die for you. I want to live only for the glory of God. You want to live for God. That's what happens when you listen to the word of God in the church. And you determine, and you resolve to live for the, for the Lord God. But as you go down the steps from the church, you think that, well, I am saved, but do I really have to live according to the word of God? I'm, I'm going to heaven no matter what, so do I have to live according to the word of God. I have my excuses and I have my reasons and I can't do this and I can't do that. So you come up with all these reasons why you cannot live according to the Bible. And you see a nice car passing by outside the church. Oh, that's a new model. Oh, how nice. I, I wish I had that car. You see a very nice dress. Oh, look at that. It's a very beautiful dress. I want to wear that dress. Your flesh... Your flesh envies so many things and want, wants to do so many things. Your flesh says, feed me good things and make me pleasant. It requires so many things and demands so many things. So we have old personality, old character that likes the things of the world. You need to understand that you still have this old man. So your inner man, your desire that you have to live for God is quenched first 70 percent, 50 percent, 30 percent by the next Sunday it's only about 20 percent you barely make it to the church and that's what happens when you're saved at first so when it says work on your salvation with fear and trembling it's because you, you gotta be fearful lest you may live your life according to your flesh not because you're fearful of going to hell with fear and trembling, work out your salvation. And that means, if you are saved, then you have to live like a saved man. You have to live a worthy life, so your heart changes, your life changes. And that's why it is salvation of character, or salvation of life, or salvation of living. This is the second stage of salvation. And as much as your character changes, your life will change. And as much as your life changes, then your whole character, whole salvation will be worked out. If you are a good tree, then you have to bear good fruit. If you say you're a good tree, but if you bear bad fruit, then, then that's a conflict. Of course, just because you are made a new tree or good tree doesn't mean that you bear good fruit straight away. 
you have to first grow to bear fruit. When the tree is young, you may not know what kind of tree it is. But when the tree blossoms with flowers and bears fruit, then you know what it is. If you live or normally as a normal Christian, if you're really born again, then you will be completely different from someone who's not born again. A puppy and a lion pup may look the same when they are very young, but as they grow, you know which is which. You know that is a dog, you know the other one is the lion. As someone who's born again, truly born again, you know that person is born again. His value system, his way of life, and his thinking, his thought, his actions, and his mind, and his life, it's different from those who are going to hell. Can a citizen of heaven, children of God, live like children of Satan? Can citizens of heaven live like citizens of hell? No. You have the Holy Spirit. You have to be different. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 7, in fact. Se chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Chapter 7 verse 1. Let us read together. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God says to us, I am your father and you are my son. You shall be my sons and daughters. And we have this amazing promise. And we never have a fear of going to hell. We do not fear condemnation or judgment. But what are we fearful of? We still have old men in us. And lest our old man would come out and deny the word of God or disobey the word of God. No, we are fearful of that. That's why we have to perfect our holiness. And that is to be separated from filthiness. You should never say filthy words. You should never have filthy minds, filthy thoughts. You should never go to filthy places. Now, Christians cannot go to any place. You cannot eat anything. You cannot drink anything. You cannot say anything. You should never say anything filthy. It will defile your heart. So you have to perf perfect holiness. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 14, it says, God says, I am holy, so you shall be holy. The Father is holy. He wants us to be holy. His children. He saved us not so that we would live any way we want, but to participate in the holiness of God. To partake in the holiness of God. So we become holy. Holy. Gradually. Day by day. We become holier and holier. We become like God. In Matthew 5, 48, Just as Father in heaven is perfect, you shall be perfect. How can we then be perfect like God, you might say? But God our Father said, He did not say, just become half good as me. Our Father is holy, our Father is glorious, as much as He is holy and glorious, we must be also, because He wants to give us that holiness and the glory of God. We have to be perfect like God is perfect, and that is our target. That's the standard we have to aim for. Day by day, gradually, our life and our thoughts and our mind must imitate that of God. So, perfecting holiness. And let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. All the filthiness of the flesh. Now, you should never go to any filthy place. Let's say that you've got very white dress, white clothes, and anything, any stain, it'll show very easily. Can you go to coal factory, coal mine? If you go to a dusty place and very dirty place, you will get dirty because even though little stain is stained on your, on your clothes, it'll show. And what happens, what do you do what, when that happens? You have to wash it straight away. How can we defile what God has given us and what God has cleansed? What is this, then the filthiness of the Spirit? Now that is to receive different doctrine. That is to desire some heresies like mysticism. If you receive anything spiritually, then you have the filthiness of Spirit. You have to have pure Spirit. And then you can have the fellowship and communication with God. So let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and Spirit. Every single day we have to cleanse ourselves. 
Now this is to work out salvation with fear and trembling. Can you understand? So we have to work out this salvation. And that salvation is the salvation of character, of growth. Now that's something that we do from the day we are saved until we enter the kingdom of God. It, it is continuing every day. Let's have a look at Second Peter chapter 2. Sorry, first, first Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Let us read together. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. In some other translation, it says, up to salvation. Grow thereby up to salvation. Now, what do newborn babes desire? Do, do they desire money? Cigarette? Do they desire alcohol? No, newborn babes do not desire anything but milk of the mother. When we are born again spiritually, we are spiritually newborn babies. Now, in fact, we have to have the, the attitude like the newborn babies every day throughout our life. We can never forget the word of God like the newborn babes that cannot forget the mother's milk. There's a hymn that goes like that. So that we may grow thereby. You can imagine newborn baby drinking the milk of the mother and growing day by day. After we are saved, we are now in the bosom of God's love. Do you know where that is? That is in the midst of born again saints. So when you are in the midst of born again saints, then that is to be in the bosom of the mother. In First John it says, No one has seen God, but if we love each other, then we know that God is in us and His love ab abides in us. When born again Christians love each other and they t dwell together, that's where God's love is. So where is mother's bosom? The, that is the bosom of love. Babies grow because of the love of the mother. These days, mothers are so busy and they just give some rubber teats to their babies and they put their babies on the pram and the mums do their own thing for whole day. Now that's the problem. Why do human babies drink cow's milk? Now the babies have to drink the mother's milk and only then the baby can grow with a proper character. Of course if the mother cannot produce any milk then that would be an exception. But the principle is the baby must drink the milk from the mother and then the baby can grow not only in physical stature but in character formation and the personality wise as well and when that doesn't happen then the babies grow as, as problem children where is God's bosom of God's love it is the midst of born again saints love one another as I have loved you born again Christians truly love each other if you don't see each other even one day we want to see each other we want to meet with each other when we come together we don't know how time passes why? Because we have the same hope, same life, and same purpose of life, same way of life. We have so, so many same things in common, and that is mother's love, mother's bosom. If you don't love church like, ma, you, you, like you love your mother, then you cannot serve God as you serve your father. So we are provided with God's love in the church, the mother's bosom. Desire the pure milk of the world, so that you may grow thereby up to salvation. This is the growth. So Second Thessalonians chapter 3 says, Your faith may grow. So we have the faith that is as little as mustard seed and it grows after that. Our faith grows. Spiritually we need to grow. This is the process of growth. A baby is born, let's say, a baby is born. The whole family love the baby because the baby is, is, is born. But three months after the baby doesn't grow, it's still the same. Three years later the baby is still the same. Do you think the family will still be happy? The family will be so worried. Now when will he grow up? The baby has to grow, grow up. A baby has to crawl and walk and 
When the baby takes the first step, then the whole family claps and they rejoice together. The baby has to see some changes. The baby has to do this and, and do certain things that the parents ask. And as much as we grow, we can please God. So to grow up in spirit, in, in faith. Now this is another expression that we can use for that. Once you're saved, we can draw a line diagonally like this. And on one side, it's me, I am, here. And the other side is Christ's character. When I am saved, the Lord is 10% and I am 90%. When you grow, then the Lord is 20% and I am 80%. And then 30, 70, 50, 50. And then that's um, almost equal. My character, 50% and char character of the Lord Jesus, 50%. And sometimes I win, sometimes I may lose. If you grow in your faith, And if you are not living good Christian life, that's because the Lord is only taking up only short or small proportion of your life and you take up the larger proportion of your life. Then you are of the flesh or you are immature or you haven't grown up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you, you're like little children, you're still of the flesh. Even though you're born again, if you follow the flesh and not spirit, then you are still young in faith. But when you grow, then you sometimes win, sometimes you may lose. In Romans chapter 7, in Galatians chapter 5, it says lust of, lust of the flesh is against the Spirit's will and they fight against each other. There is this strife. And you should not remain there. You have to grow a little bit more and then the Lord is 60% and I am only 40% and 70, 30. And then your flesh cannot do anything really. You cannot, your flesh cannot be dominant in your life. It's like a tug of war. Now if I leave the Bible here, it, it drops because of the gravity. Then it doesn't drop now. Why does it drop? Because I am holding it with a greater force than the gravity force. Just like gravity, the flesh is trying to drag me to the world. But there is a greater power than that. And if the power of God holds me up, then the power of the flesh cannot do anything. Now the gravity law cannot do anything when I hold it up like this. The life enables birth to soar up into the sky because the power of life can overcome the power of the gravity. So if you are born again, then we soar up like an eagle. Like an eagle soars up into the sky. If you love the Lord, you soar up like an eagle. There's a hymn that goes like that and even the Bible verse says that. You soar up like an eagle. Suppose that you bind, you tie up a bird and a mouse together. The mouse wants to go into mouse hole, the bird wants to fly. Now which one's going to win? It depends on what kind of bird it is, isn't it? If you have a sparrow, a little sick sparrow, it'll be dragged into the mouse hole and eaten by the mice. But if an eagle is tied up to a mouse, then it'll fly away with, with many mice. So in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 it says, you have to strengthen your inner man. Strengthen your inner man and then you can soar up with your flesh you can overcome your flesh. So this is a struggle with yourself. And you must overcome this fight. Only when you fight and win this fight against yourself, you can win the fight against the world, against the devil. This battle has begun. If you are not trained, you cannot win, can you? Our Christian life is a warfare. It is not just living your life comfortably and conveniently and every Sunday you just come to church dusting off your Bible and then you sit in the church building and then sing some hymns. Is that living service? No, that's a dead service. It is not living sacrifice. God would not like that. Your entire life must be Christian life given to God. Living in service to God. So our inner man must be strengthened. Then how can you do that? If you want to be strong and healthy physically, what do you do? You have to have good food. You don't eat any bad thing, you eat good food, you have to eat regularly, you also exercise, you work, then you become healthy physically. But if you eat all junk food and if you eat lollies and chocolates, then your teeth will rot, you have all rotten teeth, then you have malnutrition, how can you grow properly? If you want to grow spiritually, then you have to read the Bible every day, minimum three chapters. Like you eat three meals a day. Why then don't you read the Bible every day? Some people spend hours before television, smile and laugh and they go ha 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 in front of TV many many hours and then let's read the Bible. They say I don't have time. Really? 
you all you see all these celebrities and singers and all these soap operas and dramas on televisions you have so much fellowship with the television you don't know how time passes and you don't have time to read the Bible think about that is it right for for a Christian to say that you're malnutritioned spiritually and you are just about to collapse of course no wonder that happens now someone when the soccer match is on they don't even come to the church oh sister so and so you you didn't come to church last week where were you oh me I went on holiday I went to this um, tourist attraction with my friends oh yeah really now you went to the devil's birthday party yes you went along with your non-Christian friends, unbelievers, and you sang the worldly songs and danced with them. So did you really have fun? If you really enjoy that, then maybe you belong to that village. No, we don't like that. You, go, you meet them and you talk to them. You, know, we, you don't want to, you, you don't rejoice when you hear the worldly stuff. So you really enjoyed your time with your worldly friends and then you didn't come to church what would God say if you are really born again then you, you gotta forsake your bad habits and bad friends and bad lifestyle change that and there are many things that you have to quit in any case that's how you grow in your faith our faith must grow quickly so what we really want is that I want to be buried in the Lord's love and I want to have the Lord's love in my heart full in my heart my faith and my love toward him will not change but only rejoice in him and please him and when the Lord comes and I stand before him I want to stand before him with praise and honor and glory without rebuke but the Bible says there are people who will be ashamed when they stand before the Lord those who will be rebuked salvation may be the same salvation you can give up anything else but when it comes to our Christian life you should never give up anything you should never incur any loss but if you incur loss because of some lusts of the flesh and some joy and pleasure from your flesh then that's not to be done that's not good so this is the second stage of salvation from the day you're saved until you enter the kingdom of God before you go to the Lord you have to work out your salvation salvation of your life salvation of your living salvation of character this is the growth now we need to learn about this more in detail continuously and then let's have a look at the third kind of salvation Hebrews chapter 10 let's actually turn to chapter 9 Hebrews Hebrews 9 28 chapter 9 verse 28 8. Let's read together. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. He died for the sins of all the world once for all eternally redeemed so he gave his sacrifice once for all and he will appear to those the second time this is the second coming of Jesus Christ when he came the first time he came to die for sinners and the second time when he comes after the gospel has been preached all around the world he will come to take away the saints born again people and to judge those who are not saved when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, then time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up, yonder I'll be there. Only the saved will be taken up, and only the saved will be lifted up. And he will appear a second time for those who eagerly wait for him. Those who are saved are eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord. What is the greatest hope for Christians? The second coming of Christ. So he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. First coming Jesus came to forgive our sins, to, to redeem for our sins, to redeem us from our sins. 
But the second coming Christ is coming to take us away. And for salvation, he says at the end, and that salvation is the salvation that we will be receiving when the Lord comes. In Romans 8.23, it says, We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we have grown within ourselves. We are waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. Yes, we are saved, so we are the first fruits of the Lord. And we have the Holy Spirit, but we are groaning within ourselves. Why? Because our flesh still continues in sin sometimes. It, it wants to disobey the Word of God. And our flesh is weary. It can get sick. It has still pain and sorrow. So as long as we have the flesh, even those who are saved have suffering. So we groan within ourselves. So we wait for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Salvation of our body. So we receive our salvation, salvation of our spirit. And then we have the salvation of our life where our character is changing. The third salvation, the salvation of the body. Even our bodies will be saved. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 20. 20 to 21, let's read together. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. He says, we are waiting for the citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we are waiting for the Savior. We belong to heaven, so we have citizenship of heaven. If you are born in the United States, then you have the citizenship of the United States. And you may boast of that, because wherever you go, the United States will protect its citizens. Sometimes you may be a Korean, but you may have the citizenship of the U.S. Now likewise, we are earthly people and you may have earthly citizenship like South Korean citizenship but we have the citizenship of heaven so we have dual citizenship our flesh belongs to this earthly nation South Korea and our spirit belongs to which country kingdom of God yes we are confident immigration process finished completed we have been issued with the visa and we don't need to get on the plane we will go quickly. We don't need a passport. You don't need to buy tickets. You don't need to make a reservation. When the Lord comes, we will go. If you are born again, then you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, citizen of heaven. Now, God didn't save us so that we would live well and eat well in this world. He saved us so that He can give us inheritance of the kingdom of God. So in First Peter, he says, Blessed God, according to His mercy, He saved us. He made us born again to a living hope. And it is not corruptible. It is not perishable. It is not going to fade away. But this is inheritance that is reserved in heaven. Now this is our hope. The people in this world, they have some hope, wishful thinking. They will perish. But we have imperishable, incorruptible, that does not fade away. That inheritance of the kingdom of God, reserved in heaven, eternal and glorious things. God prepared all these for us already. And when you think about that kingdom of God, you want to go there quickly. I really want to hasten the going of going to the kingdom of God. When I am really tired, I wish I can go to heaven quickly. From time to time I think about that. The only purpose I am living in this world is to preach the gospel. So Paul said, whether, I, whether it's good for me to live or die, I'm not sure. If I go to heaven and die and go to heaven, it's good for me. But um, it's good for you if I remain in my flesh and live in this world more. Even though this world may be very good, it is even less than one ten thousandth of the kingdom of God. It is so amazing place. I, I thought about that. It says in Second Corinthians, it says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and this is something that we have not even comprehended with our hearts. You cannot describe heaven adequately with anything in this world. I've been to many countries in this world to preach the gospel. I have seen many beautiful sceneries and many beautiful things. Alps, Mount Alps in Swiss, Switzerland, 
and Rocky Mountain Range in the North America. And when I see these sceneries, my jaw drops and I am amazed. But whenever, whenever I see these things, even this cursed world is so beautiful, then how beautiful would heaven be? God is the, the greatest artist. So we will have the absolute form of art. You look at this, this one flower, you can see how great God is as an artist. Heaven cannot be more beautiful. There will be beautiful flowers. There will, there will be beautiful birds. It will be the absolute maximum and the best of arts. And God is also the scientist. So there is no more, no better science than that is in heaven. So this is the culmination and the absolute combination of art and science. Can you imagine that? We cannot even comprehend. In Revelation, John saw heaven. He described it with all kinds of jewels like barrels and onyx and diamonds and, and sapphires and rubies and all these pearls. Now, but how can he really describe heaven with earthly language? Words fail us. Don't you want to go there? There are many mansions, dwelling places in the kingdom of God. Otherwise, I would have told you. When Jesus said, I am going, the disciples were worried. And they were worried and they were asking this question. And, and Jesus said, do not be troubled, for there are many dwelling places in my Father's house. And I, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare a place, I will come and take you. And God has, pre place, God has prepared a place for us to stay in heaven. How beautiful. So, don't put too much heart on this world. If you go to heaven, this world will only be like a broken down toy that a little child plays with. Even less than that, if you see heaven now, if you go on a tour to heaven now, and God says, you want to stay here or you want to go back to this world, that world, then what would you say? Of course not. You don't, I don't want to go back. I want to stay here. It's terrible to go back. Wouldn't you say that? I'll give you an example, maybe not the best example. A, maggot, a baby maggot said to the mommy maggot, Mom, Mom, why do you only eat dungs? Well, don't talk about dung in the meal time. Now they, they eat of this excrement, dung. That once I was preaching the gospel in Kunsan, and I slept on a hill, and underneath it was very noisy, and I actually um, saw from the second story building out the window, it was a marketplace. It was a market day and some people were saying fish, fish. Uh, they were saying vegetables and fruits and they were selling all these kinds of things. And when I saw all these people, all this crowd, I'm sorry to say this, but I, I thought of this scene of maggots in a pit toilet. You know, all those people, they just want to make a living, working so hard because this world is everything to them. Now you look down onto this world from heaven, that's how it'll look. Now will you still want to come to come back to this world? Oh, I've got to enjoy some nice meal. You want to come back for a nice meal? No, I have to buy a house. You want to go come back to this world for a house? No, we are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. And from there the Lord is waiting for us. This world is like pilgrimage. I am only a traveler. My home is up there in heaven. Angels are calling me to come. Yes, I don't want to stay in this world anymore. Now, this is how an old hymn goes. I don't want to stay in this world. I don't have a heart that wants to stay in this world. The Lord is waiting for us, having prepared a place for us. From there, we are eagerly waiting for Him who is coming from that place. We are waiting for, for the Lord. So we are waiting for the salvation when the Lord comes. And what is that salvation? Salvation of our body. So with the power, they can subdue all things to Himself. He can transform even our lowly body, that our bodies will be conformed to the glorious body of Jesus Christ, to become glorious like Him, to be transformed. The slowly and sinful flesh will be transformed to be like the Lord's body, glorious and holy body that will never die, strong and powerful body. It will be transformed. When the Lord comes, 
those who are dead will be trans that will be resurrected with incorruptible bodies and we will be transformed and meet the Lord in the air that air in first Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17 when the Lord comes with the trumpet of God voice of an archangel the Lord will come and those who are dead in Christ will rise will be raised incorruptible those who are saved and died physically if you are saved and if you die physically your spirit will be in paradise and your your bodies will be back to the dust whether you are whether you are cremated or buried it's the same when the Lord comes again you will be transformed suddenly in the twinkling of an eye and you'll be resurrected and into incorruptible and we shall be also changed in first Corinthians chapter 15 and we will meet the Lord in the air those who are dead will be resurrected and those who are alive will be transformed straight away and go go up into air just like a terrible looking worm will, tr will transform and become butterfly and fly away this air means that we move we we are moved from this material world into spiritual world and that's how uh, that's that's the best we can translate into the earthly language and from that time we will never part from the Lord and we will be with the Lord forever and that is the greatest hope for Christians our lowly bodies to be conformed to his glorious body and we are living in days when we can meet the Lord without seeing death I'm not joking we are truly living in this end time when we can meet the Lord when the Lord comes know that I am at the door when you see all these things in Matthew chapter 24 Jesus said all these last end time signs when you see the signs know that I am at the door and that means he will come in the same generation the Lord will come so we're living in days and age when we can meet the Lord alive without seeing death the Lord may come tonight tomorrow all the signs of the coming of the Lord have been fulfilled God is only giving us more time so that we can preach the gospel to more people because there are so many people who are not born again so at the end in the last part of the New Testament what does it say it says Lord come Jesus it says Lord come Jesus that's how the Bible ends come quickly surely I'm coming quickly amen even so come Lord Jesus that's how John said but what would I say I would say Lord please tarry a little bit because there are so many people who are not saved you go to the other countries and there are so many souls who are not born again when I went to India to preach the gospel Christianity had been in India for more than a hundred years and they had a number of churches in some places but when you preach the gospel and they said we have never heard anything like this then what did you hear since uh, th during this time they had Christianity religion but they had never heard the true gospel of salvation maybe it was there at first but it was cut off now to be honest I couldn't find anybody who preached the true gospel and I couldn't find the work of the true gospel anywhere it's, it frustrates me so much so we believe that God has committed us this gospel preaching in the same times so whenever the Lord opens the door for, for us, we go, we go. God opens so many doors and we cannot cope with the demand. So we say to God, please God, tarry your coming, delay your coming just a little bit. And that's the earnest desire we have. So when the Lord comes, we will be saved in our body, salvation of body. So in the Bible, there are largely three kinds of salvations. Can, can you see that? By by grace and through faith we have been saved salvation of our soul and then after that we have the salvation of life salvation of character where our life and our mind and our life are changing by the power of the Holy Spirit this is something that we do continuously all throughout our life and then when the Lord comes when the Lord comes born again Christians who are waiting for the coming of the Lord will be transformed even our bodies and that is something that will take place instantly this is the salvation of body three stages of salvation now if you just um, summarize the first salvation it says by grace through faith you have been saved that same as receiving forgiveness of sins the same as being justified or ma made into righteous we are born again we are made into children of God we receive the eternal life and also it means we receive the Holy Spirit we became the priests of God or priesthood of, of God there are many other descriptions 
When you say, I am saved, there are so many things included in that. When you're saved, at first, the, the first thing that you understand is that your sins are forgiven. That's salvation. I am thankful for salvation and forgiveness of sins. And, but the Bible says, I am justified, made into righteous. Chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Through the redemption in Christ, we have been justified freely. Salvation of soul or forgiveness of sin. You know, when you say you are forgiven from your sins and you are made into righteous, then that's slightly different. Forgiven of sins means that your sins are all forgiven. But when you are justified or when you are righteous, it means as if you have kept all the laws positively. Now Jesus kept all the laws and He rose from the dead and He became our righteousness. We became sinners because of Adam, but we became righteous through Jesus Christ. That's why in Romans He says, for our, our transgression, He was given over to death. And He was made, He was resurrected. He, he rose again for our righteousness, for our justification. So the second Adam is Jesus Christ and He put an end to the curse of the first Adam. And we are righteous in the second Adam, in Jesus. In Romans 5.19, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Likewise, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. One man, that one man is Jesus. And He is the perfect righteousness man. Righteous man, and his righteousness, perfect righteousness, was given to us. So, this is more positive that I am righteous, we are righteous, or we are justified. We can say that boldly, and after that, we have eternal life, and we are born again. I am born again, I am a child of God, son of God. It means I am an heir of God to receive God's inheritance. So, in, in Romans 8 17, it says, heir of God, heir with joint heirs with Christ. And we must suffer with Him so that we will receive His inheritance. Now, if you are the heir, then whatever your father has, that will be yours. So your father's house is your house, my house. And after that, we receive the Holy Spirit. I receive the Holy Spirit. This is an extraordinary truth. When you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Someone says, oh, I wish I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit if He moves around in my body. No, you don't feel that. He abides, He abides, Hallelujah, He abides with me. I am rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. In John chapter 10 verse 14, On that day I am in you, and you in me, you'll know that I am in the Lord, and the Lord is in me. I cannot go anywhere without the Lord, apart from the Lord. Now beloved, the Lord is in you, so what shall you do? The Lord is in you. The Lord is in me as my master. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 he says, I am crucified with the Lord and it is no longer I who lives in me but it is Christ who lives in me. And I now live in my flesh. I live in, by faith in the Son of God who loved and gave Himself for me. He loved me and He gave Himself for me. He died on the cross. I now live in that faith. It is so thankful that the Lord saved me but not only that, He came into my flesh the flesh that is so sinful who, who lived in sin to abide in this humble abode. Now isn't that extraordinary? Now Christ lives in me. Christ is my Lord and my Savior, my Master. What shall you do? What shall I do? You must surrender to the Lord. He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings and He is my Master. You have to give all the keys to the Lord. This is my safe key. This is my barn key. This is my master bedroom key. You gotta give all the keys to the Lord. Lord, whatever you do, you do it. I am only your servant. I am your slave. The Lord did not come as guest. He came as the master. You give all the keys and you say, Lord, this key, I, I'll keep it. It's really got nothing to do with you. Then what will he say? He will say, no, you keep all. He'll give you all the keys. It's either you keep all or you give me all. The Lord wants to dictate our life completely. Why? Because He wants to give us perfect blessing, not to trouble us. You have to surrender your life completely to the Lord and live according to the Lord's will and for His glory. And then you will receive glory from, you receive blessing from Him. Now today, you have somewhere to go with your friends. Lord, it's not a really nice place to go for, for you. Why don't you stay home and get some rest? Lord, stay home. I'll be quick. I'll come back quickly. Lord, goodbye. 
So is there any place you want to go without the Lord? You, you want to go to a nightclub and do this. You go to the devil's birthday party. What will the Lord say? The, will the Lord say, okay, we'll go and have to have a good time. No, he will say, no, I have to come with you. Now, are you going to go to any place with the Lord? Whether, you, whether the Lord likes it or not, are you going to do anything that you want? Born again Christians cannot do that. Whatever the Lord hates, I hate. Whatever the Lord loves, I, I love. Wherever I go, the Lord goes. You should never go, even though you want to go, if the Lord does not want to go. Because the Lord is with you, you are never lonely. Nothing is fearful anymore. What's so fearful? The Lord is with you now. What can men do to me? There's nothing that is envious. I, I do not envy anything. I do not become jealous. I can be content with the Lord. Even though the world rejects me, I know that I am fulfilled. Even if the world loves me, if the Lord does not like me, then that is not good. I can be fulfilled and content with the Lord only. I am satisfied by the Lord only. That's our Christian life. So you must know that the Holy Spirit is in you. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 19 and 20 let's read together or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God and you are not your own for you were bought at a price therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are God's now Corinthian church people some of them committed some serious sins. They were envious and they were jealous and they committed some immoral sins. Some of them committed adultery. So Apostle Paul rebuked them so harshly and said, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Why don't you know that? Do you know why people sin? Why Christians sin? Because they do not know that the Holy Spirit is in them. If the Holy Spirit is in you, then what is your body? The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can never defile the temple. Do you not know that this is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body? Because one does not know, he or she can commit sins. You should know that. The Holy Spirit is in you. You may not know it not until now, but you now know it. He is in you. A little child may not know that he has liver, heart, kidney or whatever. He comes to know that as he learns human anatomy. Likewise, as we study the Bible, you know, we come to know that the Holy Spirit is in us. At first we may not know that, but sometime later as you learn the Bible, Oh yes, the Holy Spirit is in me. Jacob was blessed by God and he ran away from his brother Esau and he was lying in Beersheba with a stone pillow and he was sleeping. He saw the ladder from heaven and earth and then the angels were going up and coming down and God said in the midst of that, Jacob, I will be with you. Wherever you go, I will be with you. I will not forsake you. Jacob was surprised and he, he came to know that God was there. And he said, Here is God and I did not know. This is the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. I didn't know it. Beloved, even though the Lord is in you, you should not be ignorant of this truth. The Lord doesn't say, See you in heaven after He saves you. No, He is in you as the Holy Spirit. From that day of salvation, until you go to the kingdom of God. So do you not know that you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are bought at a price. Even your body was bought at a price. Is your body yours? It was bought at a price. Not yours anymore. In chapter 6, it says, It was bought with an expensive price. It was bought with an expensive price. Chapter 7, verse 23. And that's why God doesn't forsake this body but transforms it and takes it into heaven. So you are not your own, you are bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Your body after salvation, you exist for the glory of God. Whether you live or die, you do it for the glory of God. That's your Christian life. 
as much as you grow you do that but there's one thing that I have to tell you what happens if we sin born again Christians may sin because of the sinful nature I am not saying that it is okay to sin I'm not condoning or justifying that in John chapter 8 a woman who's caught in the middle of adultery was brought to Jesus and she had to be stoned to death but Jesus said neither do I condemn you but go and sin no more I am dying for your sins but go and sin no more you are not gonna be condemned because I'm dying for your sins but go and sin no more he did not save her to continue in sin but to stop sinning so in first John chapter 5 he says we have been saved in Romans chapter 6 now shall we abide in sin shall we continue in sin that grace may abound certainly not he saved us not to continue in sin but to be holy so you should not sin after you are saved but the problem is we have sinful nature our old flesh the lust of the flesh sometimes we hate brothers and sisters we become jealous and we become envious and we lie here and there we hate but born again Christians should not continue habitually we, we shouldn't we shouldn't sin habitually or intentionally so in first John it says the seed of God is in them and they do not sin it doesn't mean that we sin at all never but it means we do not sin intentionally on purpose a pig may fall into a ditch in sewerage he will lie down and he will enjoy it but sheep falls into a ditch he will jump out a born-again Christian has power to jump out of sin or sinning that's the difference now let's turn to first John chapter 2 first John chapter 2 verse 1 let's read together my little children these things I write to you so that you may not sin if anyone sins we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous I write to you these things so that you may not sin my little children means born again Christians those who are saved so you should not sin but it is possible that we may sin but if you grow in your faith and become mature then you can live without committing sins you don't have to commit sins if you are mature in your spirit in your faith then you can overcome the power of sin if you are healthy then you can overcome the virus that may come into your body if you are, you, if you are weak then you contract disease if anyone sins if anyone sins we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous if a born-again Christian sins the reason the reason why we do not perish is because we have the advocate the Lord Jesus Christ who prays on our behalf he died for us and he rose from for us and he's praying for us even now father you know that so and so was saved I died for his sins I shed my blood for her sins look at my blood and because of the prayer of intercession we do not perish and God says of course of course my son died for that sin until the end of the world all our sins all my sins are forgiven and he's praying this prayer of intercession even now so what happens now so yes we do not perish we do not can we do not be condemned but there's a problem God is so holy yes he saved our souls but he does not turn blind eye onto his children committing sins what is our Christian life after receiving salvation it is fellowship fellowship with God in first John chapter 5 verse 2 he says God is light and there's no darkness in him if anyone says he abides in light and continues in sin then he's a liar he does not have truth Christian life is fellowship with God having fellowship with God father yes my son every day you continue in that fellowship but God is light but if there is light if, if there is a darkness if there is sin in you that's darkness if you continue in the darkness and say that you have fellowship with God then that's a lie 
in Psalm 66, it says, If I regard iniquity, sin, then God will not hear. God will not hear my prayer. If you hide your sin and pray, then what would God say? God would say, hang on, hang on, stop that. Let's talk about your sin first. If you cover that and try to talk to Him about other things, no use. You have to have fellowship with God to pray to Him. Say that a son did something ter terribly wrong to the father. Before this young son would be very happy to see the father coming home, he would say to the father, Did you buy anything for me? What have you got for me in your pocket? Any lollies and chocolates for me? And so on. But one day, the son, young son was playing with his friends in his father's study and he broke something very important and very expensive. Now he is scared. The mother calls the father. Honey, our son broke this and that in your study. And the father says, what? But don't, don't punish him too much. He's crying and he can't even have lunch. Okay, I, I see, I understand. So he knows it already. The son hopes that the, the father doesn't come home today. But he sees the father coming home. Now does he go to the father, runs to the father, he hides. He can't even go to the father, he's crying. Not like before. Hey, come here! And then the son is scared. The fellowship is cut off, it's broken. So what shall we do? Is he going to continue in that way? No, he has to come to the father and says, Father, I am sorry, please forgive me, I, I will never do it again. And then the father forgives the son. Yes, it was the fault, it was the sin, but it is good that he's at least confessing to his father. And the father says, yes, I understand, I know, I know, don't worry, I'll forgive you. It's as if it didn't happen. So, when we confess, and when we sin, we have to confess completely and totally, and then the fellowship is restored. So let's have, let's have a look at chapter 1, verse 9. If we, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins and turn away from our sins, He will forgive our sins. So we have to confess. Do not hide, in your, hide your sins. Confess and forsake it. So you can continue in fellowship with God. What will you do if you don't have fellowship with God? If you don't have fellowship with God, then you cannot have fellowship with brothers and sisters. So there are two kinds of sins that a Christian may sin. Unintentional sin, or sin committing by mistake. Because of your old self, old character, maybe you swear and you are angry and you may fight and you may argue, you may covet something. Now you may do that even without you knowing. So that's a sin committing, commit, committed in, unintentionally. And they are somewhat lighter sins and you have to confess. On the other hand, the second kind of sin is a sin, sinning com intentionally, on purpose, like disobeying parents, like stealing some money, or committing adultery. No, Christians never commit a such, such a sin. But if a born again Christian is, is tempted greatly, then he or she may sin. Confession alone is not enough. He will need to be chastened by God. You commit a great sin and say, I'm sorry God, then would God say, God would say, now will, do you think that confession will do? No, bring me a rod, maybe a little cane, for a, for a grown up, a rod. God chastens. There is God's chastening. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8 onwards, God chastens His sons whom He loves, and then whoever He receives, if there's no chastening, then he's illegitimate son. He's dead. God chastens because he loves them. But those who are going to hell, God doesn't care because it, they are not God's children. But God does not ignore his own children. Know this for sure. There is God's chastening. It can show in different forms. Your physically, materially, financially, and spiritually. David sinned and David's son was killed. God is fearful God. God is strict God. And God does not overlook your sins. If you knew how fearful God's chastening is, then you'd not sin, lest you may be punished by God. So don't continue in sin. Some people continue in sin and they are beaten up so much and they don't even know that they are being chastened. The quicker, the sooner that you repent and turn away from your sin, God's chastening will be lifted up. Some people are even 
killed by God. Their flesh is killed. So in 1 Corinthians it says, their flesh is killed, they are, they are handed over to Satan, so that their souls, souls may be saved, but their flesh is killed because of their sins. And many were sick, many were sleeping, and many were weak because of their sins in Corinthian church. So I told you just uh, very briefly about this sin after receiving salvation, but Christians should never sin. And we must make sure that we grow spiritually quickly, as quickly as possible, and we must obey the word of the Lord. And how precious is our salvation that we received. Now we will meet the Lord in a little while. We are saved, and we have the same salvation, but depending on how you live your life after receiving salvation, we have different amount of reward and glory, and that is the glory of God. Salvation may be the same, but glory is different. So we must live good life. We must live faithful life. Don't just be content with going to heaven. If you go to heaven today, you will regret. If I knew it was like this, then I would have lived my life more zealously for God. But I lived my coward life and you will regret so much. But we still have time. So let us not waste our time, but live the rest of our life for God and for God's will and for God's glory. In First Peter chapter 4, he says, Let us not follow the lust of the flesh, but let us follow God's will and live the re remaining time in the flesh. Remaining time in the flesh. We don't have that much time, but we still have some time. And that short time that we have, we have to and we must live according to the will of God. Let us all pray. Our merciful Heavenly Father God, we ought to have been judged in our sins because of our trespasses and our wickedness. But you made us your children and you saved us and made us justified. And we thank you so much for this grace of salvation. And as you teach us in our daily lives after receiving salvation, may we be changed and transformed in our thoughts and in our lives so that we can obey your word. And we thank you knowing and believing that you will do so. Please hold each one of us so that none of us would be, would be lost from this fellowship. May we all obey your word and live according to the word of God as, a, as worthy children of God. So that when you come again in a little while, let us be partakers of the glory of God without any shame. Please rule our lives, each one of us. And we pray for those who are not saved around us. This eternal life and eternal salvation you have given us, the word of the truth. Let us impart these to them so that they can all be saved and use each one of us preciously for your instruments, as your instruments for your work. And until we enter the kingdom of God, let us continue in teaching of the word and fellowship in this of the saints. We pray all this in our Lord and Savior Jesus' name. Amen.